Amen. We've said several times, heaven's going to be great. Heaven's going to be awesome. Heaven's going to be incredible. Can't wait to go home. Uh, there's some crazy uh, scriptures. There, there's some amazing uh, realities about our existence even today. You realize in the book of Ephesians it says that we've already been raised up and seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. I mean, spiritually, somehow we're in Christ and somehow we're already with God in heaven. He started something. He's going to finish it one day. He's going to bring us all the way home one day. The Philippians, in the book of Philippians, it says that we're already citizens of heaven. Our, citizens, our citizenship is in heaven. And we're waiting for a, for a Savior from there. Amen. And we, this, this, this time right now, this, this place we're at right now, this is not our home. This is, this is not where we're going to end, end up, you know, just the grave and that's it. No, there's a future, there's a hope. Our citizenship is in heaven. Amen. There's just a number of these radical kind of teachings. This idea that we should not love the world. God, did, God has made us for something else. So we should love what's coming. Now, there's, there's some teaching in that I, I don't have the time to get into. But our home is waiting for us. Our home is coming. Our future is at hand. Uh, the last, as Luke said, the last several weeks we've been looking at what's heaven? What's coming? What's it going to be like? Uh, two weeks ago we looked at chapter 21, the first eight, eight verses. And we saw the, the big teaching there that we're going to dwell with God. God's going to dwell with us. But really what we saw there so much uh, in that teaching was what's not going to be there. In the first eight verses of Revelation 21, what's not going to be there? No more death, no more sickness, no more evil, no more pain, no more sorrow. It's like in one fell swoop, God's going to come and He's going to, in one action, wipe away all the tears. Everything that's going to, that we hate right now, everything that's broken right now, everything that's evil right now, everything that brings pain and suffering right now, it's all going to be gone in heaven. It's, it's, it's incredible to think about what's ahead. And then last week we looked at 21 verses 9 through uh, 27. A big chunk of scripture and man, we started looking at the place of God, the city of God, the celestial city, the holy city, the new Jerusalem. It's, it's, a, it's amazing the dimensions, the building materials, the, the way that God put that place together, the sublime nature of the kingdom come in a place, the glory of that city, the, the place that we're going to be at forever, the, the city and all that that means and all that that connotes and all that understands communion with God, with God at the end. That's the best, with God. Today we, we come to uh, almost the end of the book. Almost, is Revelation ever going to end? <laughs> First five verses in the book of Revelation today. It's amazing how much is here. What will we see? What will we, what will we experience? What, uh, what are the functions there? What, 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 what's, what's happening in our home as John sees the vision of heaven, as John sees the vision of what's coming, he wants us to know what's waiting for us. So that we'll live in hope of the coming of the King and live in hope of the coming of our life eternal. Revelation 22, please. Revelation 22, starting in verse 1. May God bless His Word. May we be given a living hope the coming of the king. Then the angel showed me the river of the waters of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything cursed, the throne of God, the Lamb, will be in it, and His servants will worship Him. They will see His face. His name will be on their foreheads. Night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun. The Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. This is all about God's world to come, God's new creation. The old is past, the new has come, John's vision. I, I, I like to think of this section as postcards from heaven. Now, I don't know, some people don't even know what postcards are anymore. There was a day that you'd travel somewhere to somewhere nice, like North Dakota. 
and you, you'd send a postcard saying, yeah, I saw the Badlands. Somewhere nice, you went to the great sand dunes of the San Luis Valley and you sent a postcard, a little, little snapshot, a little picture. Maybe most people do it on their phone now. A selfie with the uh, sand dudes in the background and a little note. We see there's all these postcards, all these snapshots, all these pictures. What has come? What, what will heaven be like? What will we find there? What will we experience there? What's in heaven? We start with this, uh, this scene of the throne. The angel showed me the river of the water of life, brightest crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And then in verse 3, it says, The throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, in that city. The throne of God, we've seen that several times in our study, most uh, prominently in chapter 4, in chapter 5. You remember that great vision, that great scene, that postcard that John saw. He was taken to heaven and he saw this great and mighty throne. The one seated upon it was like jasper, the color jasper. And we've looked at that jasper rock before. A beautiful scene, but around the throne, the glassy sea, or some of your translations say the emerald sea. And around the throne, a rainbow. And so this glassy sea, rainbow, emerald hue all over. And the, the jasper, the redness, the, 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 maybe the orange color, just the shining, radiant light around the throne. But this glorious throne, a place where God had His dominion, has His throne, His place of rule. Then in Revelation 20, we saw, we read about a great white throne symbolizing holiness and purity, a place of God's judgment, all the dead raised one day, I think in my understanding of Revelation, a first resurrection and a second revelation, a resurrection, all standing before the throne in judgment. An awesome place, an incredible place. And uh, here we have the throne, God's throne, in that place where we will live forever as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ. We'll be before the throne of God. He'll be there with us. It's, it's rather remarkable to think about. The, all, all the, maybe are right now, maybe some of you are fearful of that throne. Maybe some of you feel far from that throne, like you're not worthy to be in that place. But all the redeemed will live in the city of God with God and the Lamb on the throne. Now, we, we see in this passage uh, some of the <clears throat> understanding of God here, and this is maybe one, this is one of the passages where the first Christians start wrestling with the Trinity. It says here in verse 1, the throne of God and of the Lamb. The throne of God and of the Lamb, they're both there. Now, it's kind of like this juxtaposition of two different beings, two different persons, but they're both there on the throne. How can they be distinct and yet one? And so the great mystery of the Trinity is present in Revelation in several places, but here, here it it's just boggles the mind that our God will be there on the throne and will be there with Him forever in the eternal state. Uh, God's throne, God's the next uh, postcard, the next snapshot, the river. It's not just any river. It's the river of God. The river of life. And all your connotations, all your thinkings. I, I love rivers. I love our rivers around here. I love our streams. All the different places I've gone and seen. All the beautiful streams. All the beautiful rivers we have. Nothing compared to the New Jerusalem River. I'm going to call it that. I'm going to name it that right now. New Jerusalem River. It says it's bright like crystal, like sparkling. Just as the streets of gold. Right? Transparent gold, whatever that is. The transparent walls. The, 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 the water's pure, unpolluted, crystal clear. We, uh, we, we start talking about these things of, of rivers and thrones and trees. And we start, what, 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 do you, what are we meant to understand here? What are we meant to see? Is it physical? Is it literal? And as I said la last week, yes. Physical, literal. Is it symbolic? Is it figurative? I said last week, yes. There's both. Uh, if you've read through the book of Ezekiel, you might remember at the end of Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 47, there's this river that Ezekiel saw in his vision from God flowing from the 
temple that he saw one day it would be built. It flowed as it, as it moved farther from the city. It got deeper and deeper. The water got deeper and deeper. And it flowed to the Arabah, to the east, to the Dead Sea. And the salt sea, the salt and sea there, it's turned fresh. And life comes to a Dead Sea. It's an incredible vision. All these fish everywhere. And all these fishermen fishing the Dead Sea. It's, a, it's an incredible vision of dead turning to life. And we have different pictures throughout the Bible of that. Uh, let me just show you some of the, the scenes talking about the river of God, the river of life. John chapter 4. John chapter 4, verse 10. Uh, Jesus is talking to the Samaritan woman, a woman that the Jewish people and the Samaritans were at odds. And she's wondering, why are you talking to me? They start talking about water. She's there to get a a bucket of water to take for her daily needs. And he says in verse 10, If you knew the gift of God and who it was that was saying to you, Give me a drink, you would ask Him and He would have given you living water. <laughs> this passage is kind of what our church is named after, one of the passages. Living water, not stagnant water, not standing still water, but moving water. The ripples of water moving. And he says, I'll give you this living water that could come into your life. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get your living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us this well and drank it from himself, and as did his sons and his livestock. And Jesus said to them, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, pointing to the well. But whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. And so water equated with life, not just life, but water equated with eternal life. The, it's beautiful, the scenes in the Bible speaking water. Just a little bit later in the book of John, John chapter 7, verse 38. He said, uh, he said this in John chapter 7, verse 38. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture said, out of his heart will flow live, rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom he had believed in in those who believed in him were to receive, for yet the Spirit had not been given because Jesus had not been glorified. And so we have these, these pictures, these scenes, these, these, these figures of speech, these things about the water. It's, it's eternal life. It's the Holy Spirit. When you trust in God, life flows within eternal life. So it, it is this, this picture of heaven and the river running there. That's where life is. The river of life is there. Life eternal is there. So it is figurative and it's a spiritual picture, but it's not just that. There are several places in the book of Revelation that uh, pertain to this. Uh, Revelation chapter 7, verse 15. Revelation 7, verse 15. I love this scene because uh, all the, the multitude of saints are standing around the throne. It's, a, it's another vision, another postcard from heaven of all the worshipers at the end of time. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. He who sits on the throne will shelter them with His presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat, for the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And He will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. It's like they, the, the saints are in heaven. The people are there in, in this song, this, this, this poetry that's portrayed as the Lamb who's there, the King that's there, the one who's on the throne there. All the saints who one day when we finally meet up in heaven, resurrected, ascended, coming to the earth, coming to the new Jerusalem, the Lord Jesus will lead us to that river and we'll drink. It's, it's a beautiful picture. As in one fell swoop, God will wipe all the, way, all the tears away when we go to heaven. No more mourning, no more weeping in heaven, no more tears in heaven because they'll all be taken away. At the same time, we'll all drink of the waters of the river. It, it's beautiful and wondrous. But it's a physical place, a real place. You're going to be raised from the dead one day. Physical bodies, as Jesus was raised from the dead, given a glorified body, not to dwell in the ether, not to dwell in the air somewhere, but to dwell in heaven, the physical place, the celestial city, the holy place, the holy place of God where God dwells. You're going to be with Him one day. It's going to be a glorious place.
the throne and all of its glory, the river flowing from the throne into the city of God. Uh, we've already talked in previous sections about God's street. Can you imagine the picture of God's street, that, that street of gold? It says that the whole city was made of this transparent gold. The walls were made of jasper. Uh, all the adornment on the holy city, all the beauty of the city. Certainly there's some symbolic uh, scene there. There's some, some figure of speech there to, to describe the city using human words to try to describe what's beyond our imagination, how glorious and sublime it's going to be, but uh, it's real too. And I, I think of God's, God's river, that, that crystal clear river next to that street of gold, it says, it says here um, in verse 2, through the, the, the river is going to flow bright as crystal in verse 1, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. It's going to go to the middle of the street of the city. And so they're going to be side by side in some capacity. Maybe the thoroughfare is going to be the street and, and the rivers on the side of it. You, you can read it as the river going right down the middle of the street. But they're both going to be beautiful, intensely and insanely beautiful and glorious will our home be, the street of God. It's all, it's all about God's place. It's all about what He's doing here. Notice here it also says that there's God's tree. Imagine the most beautiful tree that you could ever imagine. Maybe you've seen some beautiful trees. I'm not sure there's too many beautiful trees in the San Luis Valley. There's a few, though. I've seen a few. Most of them are gnarly and wind-blown and baked in the sun. But one day that tree of life will be in the new Jerusalem in our home. How, how wonderful it's going to be for us to see an eternal tree. Now notice the complexity of this. Notice the intricacy of this. We, we know we, we've seen great aspen groves in Colorado. Maybe you've traveled to other places, you've seen great oak groves. But the aspen groves, all the clones of the trees, all the roots interrelated, uh, we see in this city this massive tree that becomes trees in some capacity. They're on the side of the, of the river and so we imagine just this beautiful garden-like scene in the city of God. Notice the, uh, the tree, how abundant, how prolific it is. Uh, and we come to the number 12 again. Number 12 symbolizing fullness, completeness, perfection. It's like all of God's provision is always going to be there in the city of God. It says every month it's going to bear fruit. And 12 different kinds of fruit perfection. Those of you who have fruit trees, God bless you in the San Luis Valley. It's difficult and hard, but in the city of God, that tree can be glorious. And, and the, the great symbolism there, but also the great, again, the provision of God. God is dwelling in the city. God's on His throne. God's life-giving river is there. God's tree of life, the, tr the river of life, the tree of life. We're meant to hear it again and again. This is a place of life. Abundant life, your home. And as we talked about the last few weeks, all the things that won't be there to get in the way, all the evil all gone, all the sorrow all gone, all the wickedness all gone, all the pain and suffering in these bodies all gone, all the distorted governments, all the wicked rulers of the world all gone. And we have this place of great beauty. And maybe you're asking yourself, we're, we've been talking about, you know, the, this God the Creator, God the Maker. He's going to make this city, and it's going to be this living city, this city that's wondrous and, and beautiful in all of its materials and all of its construction and all of its um, ar ar arrangements. The perfect cube that we talked about the last few weeks. The Holy of Holies is the city of God. The Holy of Holies moving through the, the Old Testament and the New Testament with the tabernacle and the temple. And then finally it's going to be that place where God is, where we will be one day. But it's, it's a living place with, with river. And, and I, I take rather literally the Old Testament when it talks about the, the rivers being full of fish. And the, 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 the places that God makes, the new earth that He's going to make is full, full of life. But the trees and the abundant, you know, picking fruit for God. Can you imagine how great that's going to be? <laughs> uh, but does it bring something to mind to you? Does it, does it, does it echo somewhere in your, your background of what you've read before? It should. 
because what we're being taught here, what we're being told here, what John is envisioning and sending these postcards from heaven in his visions, he's saying this is Eden restored. This is Eden reimagined. This is Eden brought back a final Eden. And just the, the depth of it from the beginning of the book to the end of the book, it, it's mind-blowing, the plan of God. God's breaking everything new. God's bringing everything back. He's redeeming the whole earth. Right now, the earth, it says in Romans 8, is in bondage to decay. It's, it's stuck in, because of sin and brokenness of evil. The earth isn't what it should be. It's, it's tainted. It's, it's groaning. It's waiting for the day of its redemption, of, 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 its, of its release, to be brought back to what it was made to be waiting for the sons of God to be revealed, for the resurrection to happen. But if we would just look back in Genesis real quick, Genesis chapter 2, verse 8. Let me refresh your memory a little bit. And uh, before sin came, before evil arrived, before the world fell, notice the Creator God, what the Creator God has made, and what He's doing, what He's planned. Chapter 2, verse 8 of Genesis the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east. And there he put a man in the east. From Israel's point of view, is, is Moses is writing later on from Israel, the gardens in the east. Probably you want to think about modern day Iraq in that general arena, that general area. There he put a man whom, the, the man he had formed, he put him. And out of the ground the Lord God made him to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Remember the whole drama that came about for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that apple or that peach or whatever that fruit was that Eve ate and that Adam ate came from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. God told them not to eat from it, but they did and they died, spiritually died. But the tree of life was there too. A tree of life, if you ate from it, you'd live forever. A river flowed out of Eden, verse 10, to water the garden. There it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon, and the one that flowed from the whole land of Havilah. There was gold, and the gold of the land was good. Bdellium and onyx stone were there. And so, even in the beginning of Genesis, what are we seeing pictures of? In Eden, in the garden, in the... The rest of the world, it's a picture of a temple. Uh, many ancient, ancient uh, uh, civilizations modeled their temple on the place where God was, the stars in the sky, the second level of, of heaven, and, and even here on, on earth, the third level of heaven. In, in Genesis, there's this, this beautiful picture of the other way around, is God's in His holy place, the highest heaven. God dwells in the second heaven, so to speak, the, the sky and the stars, and God even dwells in the atmosphere, in the air we breathe. He's right here, right now. But the, uh, the gold, the, the stones that, that we see in Revelation, and we see different places in Ezekiel, in Solomon's temple, decorating the different parts of the temple, like all the facets, all the components are there in the first Eden. And you think about, and, and I, I don't have time to go into this, uh, I, it's it, the kind of nerd stuff, but you start thinking about heaven. Eden was first, and then the garden was made like separate from Eden, like an adjacent place. And then outside of Eden, outside of the garden, there was the rest of the world that Adam was told to subdue and bring to order in creation. So God dwelled in Eden, then He'd move into the garden where mankind was and walk with man in the cool of the night. The fellowship, the relationship, the communion was there. And Adam was told to take dominion over the rest of the world, to bring God's presence to the rest of the world. His job was to take God's glory and spread it worldwide, which is exactly what Israel was told to do. You're my kingdom of priests. You're my holy nation. Take this to the whole world. It's exactly what the church is supposed to do. You're my people of praise. You're my people of worship. You're my kingdom of priests. Take the gospel of the whole world. And as life after life, as person after person comes to Jesus Christ, they enter into the glory of God. They enter into relationship with God. They become one of His people. The spread from 
small place around the world. From Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth, God's glory he wanted spread. Way back in Genesis, but you'll notice here, the name of the second river is Gihon, the, the one that flowed from the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is Tigris, which flows from Assyria. The fourth river is Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. The Lord God took Adam into, put him into the garden, which is part of Eden, to work it, to cultivate it, to keep it, to protect it. He was the first priest, as it were. It's just incredible all the connotations and all the scenes, but what we're meant to see is that before sin there was this beautiful world, life-giving water. There was these beautiful trees, life-giving trees, abundant life, perfect life. God was there. God was with His people. God wanted His people to take His glory and expand it to the world. Uh, we come to, back to Revelation and we see this God's plan, God's purpose, one day will be fulfilled. He's going to remove everything that pulled people away from Him. He's going to take away everything that distracted us from Him. He's going to bring us near to Him again. And we're going to once again live in this Eden-like place, heaven, the celestial city, the kingdom of God, the new earth, the new Jerusalem. I, I just can't get over the the plan of God, how wonderful it is. As Mark said, not by accident, it wasn't a, a makeup, it wasn't part B. God's plan from the beginning was always to take us through this journey to bring us to His appointed end. And for those who are in Christ, those who know Christ, those who have been saved by Christ, glorious future ahead in the city of God. Notice as we continue on the, the, these scenes, God's street, God's tree. Uh, notice what it says next here in, in verse 3. No longer will be anything accursed. That was, that was the sermon two weeks ago. All the cursed stuff of the fallen world taken away. All the cursing that was part of the fall in Genesis 3 taken away. All the war and all the dangers and all the evils of the world. All, everything accursed taken away. But the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it. And what? It says His servants will worship Him. God's servants will worship Him. Some of your translations say God's servants will serve Him. That word there for worship is a, is a major word in the New Testament. Latreia. It's, it's this word that, it, that connotes so much. But it can be translated service or worship. And, and it's the same thing, isn't it? To serve God is to worship Him. To worship God is to serve Him. The book is written to God's servants, the bond servants, or some of your translations even say slaves. Bond servants back in the first century were those who sold themselves into slavery, typically, because they couldn't eat, any, they couldn't find jobs, they couldn't pay their bills, so they sold themselves into indentured servitude. And we are described like that. Jesus Christ has bought us with His blood. He's made us His servants. The book is written to us. It says in heaven, His servants will serve Him. I long for that day. I long for that day when my worship will be pure. I long for that day when my service will be pure, when I do it right, when I do it all the time. I, sometimes I get caught up in wanting to love God so well and, and do Him so right, to, to treat Him as He deserves, to serve Him as He deserves, but oftentimes I get distracted or oftentimes my selfishness gets in the way. I, I, uh, maybe it's spiritual warfare. Maybe it's, it's uh, the world around me calling me to live for the things of the world. Maybe it's just me wanting to make much for myself. There's, uh, some of you really resonate with uh, Romans chapter 7. Look at that with me, please. Romans 7, verse 15. You, uh, you too want to serve God, you want to worship Him, and, and sometimes you feel like you're an utter failure. And there's this teaching here by Paul that really kind of gets at the, the description of, of our struggle. For I do not understand my own actions, chapter 7, verse 15. 
For I do, not what I, I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I, what I do not want, I agree with the law that is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. I take that personally to speak of non-Christians, but uh, for me, it, it, there's times I certainly resonate with, me, with, with it. I, I long to worship Jesus. I long to worship God. I long to live for Him, but sometimes I fall far, far short. But there will be a day, as the song said, when we will worship our God. We will serve our God. We will love our God with all that we are, without flaw, without error, without mistake, without selfishness, without evil. How awesome it will be. Uh, one of the great things about this promise, God's servants, this postcard, maybe John's taking a snapshot of the servants serving God, it kind of dispels this idea that heaven's going to be boring. It kind of gets rid of this idea that heaven, this, this place we're going to live forever, is just going to be this endless tedium. Maybe, maybe those of you who hate to sing uh, songs, maybe it's an endless worship service, singing songs forever. No. I, I'm looking forward to singing in heaven. I'm looking forward to all the hundreds of different ways you can worship God in heaven. Um, but the idea that uh, we're going to be bored, no, because we're going to be serving. And if you're taking notes, you can write down Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, verses 11 through 27. Remember the story of the minas? And uh, then you can write down Luke chapter 25, or, or Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. The, remember the story of the talents and how at the end of time, when the master comes back, those who had done well with what they were given, they were given more responsibility in the kingdom of God. His servants will serve Him. I, I can't wait to serve the Lord one day and we're going to be serving God for eternity, worshiping Him for what He's done. And it'll be easy in that place because we're going to see Him and how great He is. We're going to realize we're in heaven. We're going to see all the, all the works He's accomplished and our response in that perfect place with our glorified bodies, with our renewed minds, we'll be able to worship rightly and uh, forever. Heaven's going to be great. We get to serve our God. But uh, it moves on a little farther in, in, in Revelation that we got God's throne, God's tree, God's river, God's street, God's servants. Uh, there's just so much here. Then it says in verse 4, they will see His face. Man, this, this is incredibly deep and incredibly wonderful, but uh, you realize when you read something like this through the, through the lens of the Old Testament, some of the psalmists long for this to see God some of the people long to see God, to know God in, in, a, in a special way, but it was always somewhat distant. And even today, we long to see God. But the, the word see there, it's, it's more than just a physical, like face to face. It comes more along the lines of knowing Him and understanding Him and grasping Him. Uh, if you look back at, again, it, I just can't help myself to show you some of the scenes, some of the snapshots from the Old Testament. Uh, Exodus 28. Exodus 28. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, 33. Exodus 33, verse, verse, verse 18. Exodus 33, verse 18. Uh, God is, uh, it's after the golden calf incident and, and God threatens, he's, he's not going to go with the people anymore. And, and Moses says, no, you better go with me. If you don't go with me, I'm not going. And then Moses says, show me your glory. Um, in verse 18, Moses said, please show me your glory. And he said, I'll make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I'll be gracious to whom I'll be gracious and I'll show, mer show mercy to whom I will show mercy. But... You cannot see my face, for the man who sees me, uh, for man shall not see me and live, in verse 20. Man shall not see God and live. You can't see all of God's glory. You would melt. You'd instantly vaporize. You'd be destroyed immediately in your unholiness in and of yourself and of myself. But then we, we go to the New Testament and what happens there. Jesus comes and... And He brings God's glory near. 
uh, ch John chapter 1, verse 18. John chapter 1, verse 18. No one has ever seen God, says the Apostle John. No one has ever seen the only God who is at the Father's side, but the one, the only God who is at the Father's side, He has made Him known. Jesus has made Him known. He, he's, he's revealed. We, we, no one's ever seen God face to face in this age, in this time. No one's ever grasped Him totally, but Jesus has shown us the Father. He's shown us the Almighty. He's revealed who He is. Um, there's, there's some beautiful scenes in this, this matter. Uh, I'm going to take you to 3 third, third John, verse 11. 3 John, verse 11. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. There's this understanding through the scriptures that to, if you really claim to know God, you'll live a godly life eventually by the grace of God, by the power of God. But the claim here that, that, the, that the elder writes, he writes to him and he says, uh, people that claim to see God and they're living an evil life, they don't know God. And so this scene, this picture, and it's many times in the Psalms too, to see God is to be satisfied. To see God is to know Him. To see God is to be close to Him and near to Him and, and love Him and realize Him. And then the response will be worship. Uh, one day we will see God physically, literally. But one day we will know God completely. And we will be satisfied by God. We'll grasp Him, we'll understand Him, we'll know Him fully. So God's face we will see uh, in Revelation 22. Another snapshot is God's light. It says, Night will be no more, verse 5. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light. In the city of God, the place where we're going, our heaven, God's glory will be there fully will be capable of receiving it in our resurrected, glorified bodies. We'll be able to walk in it and live by it. Always in the presence of the glory of God. That's what we'll see. That's what we'll experience. That's what we'll know. It'll become the new normal for us. Forever. Perfection. Beauty. Awe. Wonder. And then the last one. They will reign forever, reign forever and ever. This is God's world, and His saints will reign. And you say, what? Reign? That, that sounds like a ruler, like governance, like dominion. And again, it takes us back to the Old Testament. It takes us back to the original plan of God. God's planning something great for your eternity. God's planning heaven for your eternity. It looks a lot like what he started with. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God, God created man in his own image, and the image of God he created him, male and female, he created him. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves along the earth. God's made us originally to be His vice regents, His vice rulers. He's charged us with the authority to take care of His creation, to expand the boundaries of His creation. He's made us to be His people, to serve Him. Uh, Hebrews kind of sums up this little, this little verse. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 6. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 6. It has been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little, uh, for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. 
that psalm in the in the original the original psalm the idea was that God made people in his image to rule his earth one day God's world will be once again placed in the hands of his people whom he's redeemed and they will serve him they will seek to glorify him by taking care of all stewarding everything that he's made to his glory now we won't rule over peoples because there's no more nations there anymore that are lost or unredeemed all the nations have come into the kingdom that all the all the people that have been saved they come into the kingdom they're bringing in their worship they're bringing their glory so all the peoples of the world will be placed in a position to serve God and I don't know what your role is going to be I don't know what my role is going to be but if we serve faithfully here with what God's entrusted to us one day we'll be given more responsibility in heaven in the place of glory you start running down this list and we can imagine more God's throne God's river God's street God's tree God's people serve him God's face we're gonna see it God's light, God's God's kingdom come God's world that we are gonna be placed to serve in heaven is going to be incredible heaven is going to be wonderful heaven's going to be a place of purpose and meaning a place of satisfaction a place of worship and God will be there we will be with our God forever so at the end of the Revelation we've seen this picture of the Holy of Holies coming God's temple is coming upon the earth there's no need for a temple because he's there and here at this end part we've seen a new Jerusalem is coming but more than that a new Eden is coming what God originally planned for you will be perfectly fulfilled one day in his kingdom rejoice and worship and praise God beyond that in your world today in your life today in your sufferings and trials today put your hope not in governors or governments <laughs> not in the, your bank account, not in your property, not in your health. Put your hope in heaven. Put your hope in the God who is coming for you. Put your hope in your future. Live for that, citizens of heaven, because it's going to be all that God has made you to be. Praise be to the Lord. Worship team, would you please come. For God Almighty, we we thank you and we praise you for giving us the grace, um, giving us this word, giving us this message, giving us this revelation, telling us what's ahead. Lord, may it spur us on to, uh, to live for you. May it spur us on to live in righteousness. May it spur us on to follow you and keep the faith, knowing that the best is yet to come, knowing that we're not home yet. We thank you for the inheritance you've, you've pictured for us. Thank you for telling us what's coming so we can live in anticipation. Give us the grace to do so. To look to that city that's ours and to get excited about it and to live for it. Praise you, Lord. Bless us today. Thank you for meeting with us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for taking care of us. Thank you for your plans to bring us all the way home. In your name we pray. Amen.